Hi, everyone. I'm Colette Bancroft, the book editor at the Tampa Bay Times, and I am delighted to welcome all of you to the virtual Tampa Bay Times Festival of Reading. This is the festival's 29th year, its second year as a virtual event, and I am delighted to be kicking off the festival tonight, uh, our first night, with the brilliant Lauren Groff. We'll be taking questions for Lauren a little bit later from you in the audience, so please type your questions into chat. Many of you know Lauren for such acclaimed works as her short story collection, Florida. She lives in Gainesville and knows the material well, maybe all too well, um, and her best-selling novel, Fates and Furies. She's here tonight to talk about her latest novel, Matrix, which is a finalist for the National Book Award for Fiction, and it was just announced today, is also a finalist for the Andrew Carnegie Mal uh, Medal, sorry about that, uh, for fiction. Um, I would call that acclaimed, um, all that adds up. Um, welcome, Lauren, it's great to see you. Are you are you Zooming from Gainesville? I am Zooming from Gainesville. And if we're lucky, the dog won't be snoring, the children won't be bursting in like the Kool-Aid men. <laughs> we'll see, we'll see. Yeah. I wish I were in Tampa. Uh, I, wish, <laughs> I wish we were too. I wish we were together in a room doing this. Same. And next Same. time, I hope we are. Um, but your books always surprise me. You're a writer who, who doesn't repeat herself. They're, they're clearly there are themes and ideas that, that recur and come back in your books in different forms. But, um, but, you, but every book is fresh, and that's certainly the case with Matrix. You've written historical fiction before. Um, Arcadia was set in uh, the 60s and 70s mostly. Um, your first novel, The Monsters of Templeton, went all the way back to uh, a couple of centuries to the founding of Cooperstown, your hometown. Um, but in Matrix, you go all the way back to the 12th century. <laughs> um, it's a big swoop. And I wonder if you could start by talking about why you chose that setting and why you chose the historical figure Marie de France uh, as your main character. Sure. So I have... Um many answers for this as you know i'm not not a simple person uh i think one there um i i've been in love with marie de france since i was in university i um i don't love big seminars i get very anxious around a lot of people at once uh and i would sort of sneak into my professor's office hours and be like can you please do a tutorial with me so i ended up doing probably i don't know 25 tutorials when i was in undergrad uh, and one of for a full year, I did Ancien Français, which is old French. Mm -hmm. Delightful. I loved it so much. I did a great number of translations. And one of the people that I translated was Marie de France, who is the first published female poet in the French language that we know of, uh, which is so exciting. And her her book of Lay, which are these Breton, basically short stories in poetic form, are magnificent. They're full of just wild things, talking stags and boats that are enchanted that float off to, to unknown realms and um, lovers who die on mountaintops. And so like, there's so many wonderful things happening in these lay. And it's, it's such a weird and wonderful book that I since since college, I've wanted to do something about her. For a while, I thought I was going to do a, a translation and that just never got off the ground. And then um, I was actually in the process of writing another book, which will be, knock on wood, my next book coming out. And I was at the um, Harvard has this wonderful institute for it's called the Radcliffe Institute for Advanced Studies, where people from all academic disciplines and artistic disciplines come together in order to share ideas in a way that we don't generally tend to in academia, because people in academia tend to sort of stay in their little silos. Um, but here you sort of thrust together with astrophysicists, with chemists, with um, sculptors, with people who do things so radically differently that, of course, your brain is going to bend and, and take on new shapes. And, and for a long time, I thought I was going to write a novel about black holes because I'm just like endlessly fascinated by them because of this, these astrophysicists. So I was in this place and I was writing this book that I still really love when um, two things happened. One, I came back from 
a trip to Arizona and I watched on the plane this 1939 film by George Cukor. Uh, it's called The Women. It is such an amazing, it's an amazing film. Uh, one of the writers of the screenplay is actually Anita Luce, who uh, it was the great novelist. She wrote uh, Gentlemen Preferred Blondes. That became a movie too. But the novel itself, if you're looking for a very, very funny novel, that's an amazing one. Um, so it's this very funny movie and the only characters in it are women. But of course, it's from 1939, so the only thing they talk about is men. And then, like, I was like, the, the hurdles to clear for the Bechdel test were so yeah. small, and it just didn't do it. It was so frustrating. So I, you know, I had this sort of love-hate relationship with this film, and then the very next day, I sat down and started. And my friend, Dr. Katie Bugis, who is now teaching at Notre Dame, started to give this lecture on. Uh, the liturgies and the manuscript, liturgical manuscripts of 12th century nuns and it, everything combined. It's almost, sometimes when you get a book or an idea for a book, it's really as though um, it's it's nuclear, what is it, fission or fusion? Uh, fission, when everything comes together and explodes and becomes something like much larger than it was. So I was sitting there and my love of Marie de France came in and this film from the night before came in and um, the, my inability to write uh, about the world between 2016 and 2020 for obvious reasons came in because it, it felt at the time that there was so much going on that I couldn't actually ethically try to grasp it in a work of uh, contemporary fiction. But I could maybe talk about some of these larger issues sort of slantwise in the past. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, which you which you did. I I had I had to ask whether you were educated by nuns because I was, and I'm I still have very complicated attitudes about this. And and it, you know some of it is you know they really did whack you over the knuckles with rulers and you know put you in the coat closet if you snatched them back. But also I think and this book really sort of sharpened this sense for me. They gave me a sense of a world or a little world where women had power, where women ran the show. And um, I wonder if you could talk, uh, were you educated by nuns? Were you affected by them as a kid or at a later point or? No, so I, um, no, I was not, and I'm not Catholic. And the only exposure I'd ever had until a few years ago to any nuns was, you know, Gidget. And a couple of, and a couple of really wonderful books, right? There is Marriott and Ecstasy yeah. by Ron Hanson. That's an amazing book. And then um, The Corner That Held Them by Sylvia Townsend Warner, which I actually didn't read until halfway through the editing of Matrix. Uh, but no, it wasn't until uh, I began doing a huge amount of research and then eventually I did stay for a few days at an abbey in Connecticut uh, and it, it's called Regina Laudis. It's magnificent. Uh, it didn't teach me anything about the book I was writing, but it sort of gave me some of the more underlying, you know, the whole um, iceberg analogy about a book. It was, it's some of the stuff under the water, definitely, it, it came through. But now uh, I was just really interested in a collective of women who had power within their own world uh, and in opposition to, to the larger hegemonies, right, the hegemonies um, or the, the, the structures of the time. This book would pass the back door. Oh yeah, for sure. <laughs> like in the first page. Yeah. yeah, the yeah. First page. I'm hard put to think of male characters in the book. I don't, are there any male characters who even have names? No. Yeah. No, it is on purpose. Yeah. 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 There are men who sort of appear on the periphery and do things, but they're not. They're you know. not individuals. No, yeah. there are no individual men. And um, this is on purpose because as I was doing a great deal of research, it uh, frustrated me to no end to find that the only women who are actually deemed worthy of, of being put into the history books or into sort of records of note were women who are either saints, and of course saints were put into you know the pure, right? <laughs> or queens, and queens are only there because of their relations, right? They're the, the daughters, the they wives, the, right, right. And so that was immensely frustrating then you know, the long history of literature is the history of women sort of being like 
dark shadows crawling along the walls and then the men, the men take center stage. And so I really wanted to flip things. And yeah. so they're very intentionally no, no individual men. Yeah. In yeah. And you yeah. do that too. I mean, the, the stereotypical notions of an, of an abbey or a convent is, is, oh, those poor women, you know, they're shut away from the world and, you know, have, which, by which we, we mean they're shut away from men and and they're they have this very regimented life and this very de deprived sort of life i think you know the if you ask say, people about medieval you know abbeys that's that's the conception and and you do totally subvert that and i wonder if you can talk a little bit about that and i wonder how much of that of the details you you use came out of the research so uh yes i i know for a fact that some abbeys were very poor very sad the lives were very regimented they were basically the way that our stereotypes of them were but i don't like the simple single story right we um i like the complicated story the story that complicates ideas that we hold that are too simple yeah. and so i do also know and i and through the research uh that i was doing i did see the really large set of reasons why women would go to these places it wasn't just because they have a vocation which is a beautiful and purely good thing there were a lot of nuns who did have that but uh, they were also sent there because they were they were not they would not fit in. They had a funny smell to them, right? They they refused to get married. They were lesbian, right? They um they were some of them were political prisoners because say for instance at the time the Welsh were rising up against the crown of England, and so they would ride in and steal the princesses and then put them in the, into these abbeys without allow, allowing to the, them to get out so that they wouldn't raise more Welsh princes who would go off and try to kill the king, right? So so there, there's a, a great number of reasons why these women would find themselves there. Or at the end of their marriages, their husbands are dead, their children are set up in the world, they're just tired of the world of men and they just wanna go somewhere nice and peaceful and like get rid of all of that angst. Uh, so I that, that's a great one too. Um, I actually tried as hard as I possibly could to not throw much invention at the book. So uh, the vast majority of the things in the book are things that I did research uh, or things that I found in research that were very obviously apocryphal, uh, but I still took them and <laughs> put them into the book because they're still somewhat in the historical record. And of course, I did use my uh, powers of invention to bend some things sure. to change other things, right? But but um, the the timeline of say Eleanor of Aquitaine's life is exactly the, her timeline, for instance, yeah. and um, the the political things that are going on, sort of as noise behind the book, are were the political things that were going on for sure. Yeah, yeah. yeah. As you say, the, the, some abbeys were th that um, poverty stricken stereotype, and this one is at the beginning mm -hmm. when she arrives there it's it's uh, um it's falling down it's going broke it's uh, the most many of the women are sick or starving mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and over the course of the book the abbey changes it becomes you know first it gets a little better and then it gets a lot better and then it becomes really you were talking about politics, it becomes a, a, a political and economic power. Mm -hmm. And um, as as many abbeys were back then, because they owned a lot of land and, you know, they had positions in, in the social order. But also, of course, Marie changes. Mm -hmm. she, she becomes, um, you know, she goes from this angry 17 year old girl cast out of the court um to first just kind of deciding to buckle down you know and clean up the accounting books and then she becomes a sort of um, manager and a strategist and finally she's a leader she she kind of becomes some of the things that she admires Eleanor for but she also goes through a series of changes in her attitude toward religion when she first gets there she's not religious 
even though as a child, she accompanied her mother on one of the crusades. And I love, I love her family, her, the seven Viragos. I just, I want to read a book about them too. Um, uh, but she's not, you know, when she gets to the Abbey, she's like, yeah, okay, religion, fine. You know, she can mouth the prayers, but she has no real emotional connection to it. But after a while, for complicated reasons, she becomes a believer and later she becomes a mystic, which mm. is, you know, a major transformation. And I wonder if you could, I've just asked you a very long question. <laughs> <laughs> Marie changes. Talk about that. Sure. Yeah. Well, I mean, of course, that is the basis of a work of fiction that the, the characters have to uh, have a dynamic attitude to the world in which they live over time. Um, but so Marie does change. She changes very profoundly. Her religious uh, change occurs when she falls in love with the women around her, not just, you know, the the, the love that we think of when it comes to uh things like this but also she just she, she she loves the role that she plays she loves that she sort of creates a protective space all around them with her own forces and her own um, brilliance and her own power and um her religion comes out of that <clears throat> that one-to-one -one love she, as she recognizes in each of the, these women who trust her very deeply uh, the spark of God, I think, and and she's able to to use that, and that becomes her her true vocation in a very real religious way. Um, I I did want to pay a little bit of homage to the um, the non traditional ideas of uh, a nun's religion, right? I think part of the going to visit Regina Laudis, one of the great um, boons of that time was that the nuns were very open about their struggles with doubts mm -hmm. and about how even though they did have vocation it's very hard to turn your back on the modern world and then go into enclosure but how how difficult it was and how uh, really just being in this community that was the thing that animated them and sort of lit the, the religious fires in a very real way so I wanted to to think through the complicated vision of that. But I also was so deeply inspired by my research into medieval abbesses who were, they did tend to be women from the noble classes uh, because they had to be. I think the only women at the time who were allowed uh, any sort of education were noble women because they were being raised to take over the large estates of their husbands when they went off to the crusades or to to, to fight their neighbors and like die of a lancet didn't through the come heart, back. right? <laughs> yeah, right, exactly. So so they were the ones given literacy, given numeracy. Um, but so these were these women who a lot of them were just extraordinary business people. And I think that's one of the things that this book became to my absolute surprise and delight. It was this book about um, Marie turning this Abbey into a functioning business. I mean, I'm not interested in business. My husband would say that he's a business person, but I am interested in manifestations of power and the way that um, one can create power for oneself within what seems to be a, just a really enclosed, very tight, very, um, very oppressive system. And, and I was trying to find ways for Marie to do that, to sort of expand her power. And eventually she does become a mystic. And this comes out of my study of medieval mystics. I love them so deeply. All I want to do is spend time with Marjorie Kemp and Julian of Norwich and Hildegard von Bingen. And the, the person, it was actually Hildegard von Bingen who is, um, I have this this image of her. I just love her so dearly because I think she's uh, one of the great geniuses of any age. She she would do she would have been a great genius anywhere at any time. Um, she was a, a musician. We still listen to her music. She's amazing. She was uh, deeply versed in medicinal herbs. She actually wrote a book about medicine that was used for four hundred years later. But she also after menopause set in sort of the fertility of her body left her, but the fertility of God came into her. And so she started seeing these visions and these visions 
gave her. And I, I believe that they're real. They, they feel very real. Who knows? But I, I really, truly believe that she was getting these incredible gifts of God. Uh, but at the same time, she was able to use these gifts of God with her great, great genius in order to, to build power for herself within the world and without it at the same time. So she uh, she was able to get donations to create her own abbey. She was able to uh, to become the advisor for popes and kings. I mean, she was just this extraordinary human being who both was given a gift and then knew how to use that gift, how to spin that into more space for herself within the world. Mm -hmm. I, I I'm circling back a little bit to what you said about, about Marie learning to love these women um, and appreciate them. One of the things I like, it, you know, it, she becomes a manager. And, and one of the things that struck me most was when she realizes all of the women in the con in the Abbey have been given jobs they're least suited for <laughs> on the, on the proposition that, it's good for the soul to be humiliated and abased <laughs> because you know pride is original sin and if you're if you're a terrible cook we'll make you a, we'll put you in the kitchen and you'll <laughs> suffer and so will everyone else and she finally comes to the realization that maybe that's not working so well and she starts changing things around and um I just I love that because it's both, as you say, it's 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 the one to one kind of human connection that her genuine faith grows out of, but it's also really smart management, <laughs> you know, because everybody benefits from it, and and I I love that later on some of the nuns are just known as like the blacksmith nun, you know, and <laughs> that and that figuring out what the women are good at is one of the ways up that other women are good at and other women can succeed at within you know that world is one of the ways that she gains power um, and i just you know it really that really struck me <laughs> yeah, Marie is a heretical thinker for sure. She mm -hmm. she does not take a lot of things as um uh set in stone and i think that she also believes very deeply in the body i mean she's a very she's very much an animal she believes in pleasure she yeah. doesn't believe she believes probably that pleasure is a gift of god and it's not something to to hate and that too is very very heretical when it comes to the catholic church right um, especially in, yeah. yeah especially in the, yeah when suffering was the thing that one was chasing so I think um, for her to to find the thing that the people loved to do and were good at because they loved it, that that was something that she allowed everyone around them. And she did it out of purely practical reasons, but then yeah. it became something of her own quiet revolution. Right. Yeah. Plus well, she got a good cook in the kitchen. I mean. She got a good, she got, she got good clogs for everyone. Yeah, she did. The, the shoemakers. The yes. Nest. Nest. I love Nest. Oh, she was great. Yeah. I wanted to this... read a book about her too. I... <laughs> <laughs> that was healthcare. Let me tell you. That's right. Uh, the, the title of the book is Matrix. And that word, of course, has many, many meanings. And the book reflects many of them. But one of the things it, it refers to is the, the labyrinth that Marie has the, the, the nuns build around the abbey. Mm -hmm. and, um, and I wonder if you can talk a little bit about that and, and how that the title ties into that and, and into the other meanings of Matrix. Yeah, so the labyrinth was something that uh, had sort of haunted the corners of my perception as I was writing this book. I, I write a lot of very fast drafts in the beginning and then sort of put them aside and start over again. Mm -hmm. And I couldn't at the beginning understand the, the underlying architecture, the structure of the book. Yeah. I couldn't figure it out. Um, and then in the course of my my studying, my historical research, I saw a few things. The first was 
I just kept seeing an image of um, the Chartres Cathedral. And it's inset in Chartres, there's this incredible unicursal labyrinth, right? In the stones there. That's actually very moving to see in yeah, person. Yeah, it's, 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 it's incredible. Yeah. It's incredible. And it just kept coming up for some reason. And it, like, it, it's one of those, um, I forget what it's called, the synchronicity when you're actually, there, there's a word for it. When you, you're you're not really looking for something, but you just kept keep seeing it all over the place. Um, and then you, uh, and then, so I kept seeing it all over the place. I even printed one out and I realized um, after I heard this apocryphal story where Eleanor of Aquitaine uh, is this very powerful, mythical, was a real person, but because news was not disseminated, there was no printing press, there was no um, newspaper, there's no, uh, you know, your job did not exist. Uh, and people really just spread news by songs and stories, um, oral um, storytelling. And so she was this fearsome person that sort of emerged into a lot of the myths of the time, Eleanor of Aquitaine. And one of the myths was, uh, and, and this is predicated on some truth, um, her second husband, Henry II of England, uh, Eleanor is also a queen of France. She came over to England. Uh, she, um, they didn't get along very well. As soon as their sons were uh, of age, she started goading them to take their father down and become kings. And so uh, he, he hated her, she hated him. And at some point he um, had this beautiful mistress, very young mistress that he really loves. And the story was that he built this garden bower for Rosamond, his, his dear beloved mistress Rosamond. And he did it in order to keep her safe at the center of this labyrinth bower from his wife, Eleanor, who was in the stories because women could never get along in, in stories, um, was out to get Rosamond. And apparently, because Rosamond did actually, in fact, die young, um, they say that Eleanor got in and poisoned her. So I, th I heard that story. I thought about the Labyrinth of Chartres and I was finally like, oh my God, what I'm doing is of course, I need to I need to write um, this book into the form of a labyrinth. I need to actually make it a eudicarsal labyrinth. And obviously it's a, tracing the course of Marie's life um, mm -hmm. all the way to the center, right? Um, and there's no getting out of the center. We all die. Mm -hmm. um, and so, um, uh, of course, the word matrix is, as you said, it means many, many things. It means mother is from the womb. Um, it's from the Latin for, for mother. Um, but it also, you know, it means um, uh, organizational structures. It's sort of the bedrock in which uh, gems are set. It means um, a bunch of, it's, it's sort of the, the original from which other things are created. So uh, the original record, the original um, mold out of which other sculptures are made, things like that. Um, and so I, I thought of this and I thought of, uh, the way that at the time, in order to seal a letter, you would use a seal matrix and you sort of press things in. Mm -hmm. And in some ways, the um, the the labyrinth that Marie and her nuns build is a really enormous seal ma matrix sort of pressed into the land, right? It's, yeah. it's something that's pressed through time. And my vision of the book, and one of the, one of the many, many drafts of this book was actually they are very more it was, it was a, there was a much more explicit toggling between now and then mm -hmm. um and there th this was the tracery that was left behind was the sort of yeah but that's not in the book anymore yeah yeah there's they they're a very sort of slant you know looks toward the the present but uh but it pretty much stays there and eleanor it was interesting to me eleanor is such a huge force in Marie's life. I mean, she's the one who puts her there. And, and yet Marie also, you know, worships her. Mm -hmm. And it was interesting to me that she, that you kept her there, but you kept her at such distance. Um, because, you know, you, this was fictional and you could have, you know, you could have brought her there. You could have brought Marie to court. You could have, you could have done all those things. And, um, I wonder why you chose to make Eleanor that kind of distance influence. Well, um, yeah, I think I'm on mute for, okay, yeah. 
Um, so for multiple reasons, one of them was I really just had to, to play with what I had. And actually, Eleanor, because she was so powerful and she was so important, we know where she was throughout the course of her life. So I actually had to make sure that she wasn't at this, you know, Royal Abbey that doesn't really exist. It's sort of a conflation of Barking and Jasper Abbey. Um, but the other thing, too, is uh, when Marie was in the court of Eleanor Backwoodson, that court is uh, was historically an extraordinary court for storytelling. That's yeah. where the troubadours came from, right? Then, and, and she put a great deal of money and time and love into the development of art, uh, mm -hmm. it, of of many different kinds of art, but definitely narrative art. So Eleanor was was very much a godmother of of oral writing at the, and and actually writing writing at the time too, and. Out of these these courts came an, a, a, almost a secondary narrative convention called courtly romance. Yeah. And a lot of courtly romance actually has a very codified system of rules that mm -hmm. when you, you read these romances, a lot of things are very similar. So Marie, being a very young person, comes to this court. She's, her, her mind is blown by everything that she's hearing, everything that she's seeing. And she's not incredibly religious. So uh, what she does is she takes into herself this secondary narrative substructure for the world and starts mm -hmm. to build her own understanding of the world on top of that narrative substructure. So this courtly romance substructure. So one of the things that, that uh, occurs in courtly romance is, for instance, um, marriage is no impediment to true love. Right, for instance. So so either member who's loving, it doesn't matter if they're married. Distance is no impediment to true love. So you're basically, courtly romance is about idealizing a person and sometimes never even coming close. And in fact, coming close actually destroys some of the love. So, yeah. so Marie took this into herself and um, she started to see, of course, Eleanor as her, her beloved. Uh, and, and she's in the role of the knights because she always subverts these roles, right? This is her job is to subvert these roles. And then Eleanor becomes a goad when she doesn't allow Marie to come back uh, to the court. She becomes the person against whom she needs to fight. And Marie is one of these people who needs to have an, a, an enemy, basically. Uh, she's a, a, a model. She, she shows Marie through her own ambition and her own uh, abilities how to sort of negotiate power. And she becomes a friend. So it's, it's, it's this relationship that um, it starts really far out and then comes closer and goes away. So it, it's it's a dynamic relationship. I, I wanted it to be one the whole way through. Well, I think in a few minutes, we want to go to the audience questions, but I want to ask two more things. One is I heard that there's that this that Matrix is in development for television. <laughs> uh, we'll see. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Uh, one of my favorite um, playwrights, her name is Heidi Schreck. She wrote What the Constitution Means to Me. She's so brilliant. This is a, this is a Pulitzer winning play. It's so good. Um, but she was in the middle of the pandemic, as were we all, and she read this book early. And I think something about the um, idea of, uh, well, first, like an isolated community of women. But also, Marie's building something the whole way through and making something beautiful out of something terrible that really, I think that brought her um, some hope. And Heidi is, like so many people, which I've discovered as I've brought this book into the world, a secret medievalist. There are so many secret medievalists. Who would have known? <laughs> so she knows a lot of the things that I'm sort of hinting at or mentioning or, or sort of, yeah. we'll see. We'll see what happens, but I, I feel good about it. Yeah, well, I, yeah. Would, I sort of boggled my mind at first to think of it, and but the more I thought about it, I thought I'd watch that. I wouldn't. <laughs> but uh, and the other thing is, uh, as you said earlier, you were writing a different book mm -hmm. when this one, when that sort of nuclear fission happened, and this one took over. Um, but you have you have gone back to that one, mm -hmm. and and it's I think tentatively scheduled for uh, 20, 2023. Yes. And um, I know it's, I know it's early, but, I, but 
the title is out there and the kind of subject matter is out there and the fact that it seems in some ways sort of related to this book. Mm -hmm. um, I wonder if you can talk about it a little bit. Sure, yeah. Um, it's called The Faster Wilds uh, mm -hmm. right now. And I um, I was Im imagining doing a female Robinson Crusoe because mm -hmm. Robinson Crusoe is one of my favorite books. Mm -hmm. It is bonkers. It is <laughs> such a bonkers book. And one of the reasons why I love it so much is because it's... I don't, I don't, I don't know if this was intentional. It might have been intentional, but it really sh codifies um, Calvinism, right? <laughs> like oh. English Calvinism yeah. in particular. Because here's this man who escapes to this this island all by himself, and what does he do? But he builds a table, <laughs> like, like like a workspace. He builds a workspace. Uh, it's all about work. Uh, but it's it's really interesting to me. And then I um, I what I want to do, and knock on wood that it ends up succeeding. But uh, I want to write a triptych, and so Matrix is the first, and The Master Wilds is the second, and the third is something set now that I'm kind of struggling with, but. It will happen or it won't. <laughs> um, and uh, they don't share anything, right? None of the characters are the same. None of the ideas are the same. Uh, even the language is very different because in the second book, because it's in 1609, I'm playing with a great number of Shakespearean words and uh, rhythms and ideas. And it makes me really happy to do that sort of stuff. Uh, and the next one, you know, we'll see. Um, but what's happening is I want them to be like whales sort of singing under the water, right? I want them to have thematic ideas that are really, um, that, that are linked somehow. I, I want them to talk about women in um, sort of rigid structures, uh, encountering nature in their own ways, and the way that the religious structures and the ideas of God uh, change the way that they interact with nature, uh, and the way that possibly religion is uh, to blame for climate change. <laughs> and there's so many things that I want to, to be sort of swirling about and and speaking to each other over the distance. And I, and I would trust the reader to make those connections. And I have that one to look forward to. Well, knock on wood. <laughs> <laughs> well, shall we switch over now and uh, take some audience questions? Ellen? Sure. Ellen, do we have some questions from the we audience? We do. We have a, a, a number of questions um, to make it a little easier on me. If anyone has more, put them in the chat, please. Um, so you were just talking about religion. So I'm going to take one. I'm not going to go in order. But um, I think you answered a little bit of this earlier on. But do you have any religion in your background and upbringing? I do. Yes. I, uh, I was a very fervent child, <laughs> a very very passionate and i had nowhere to put it uh except for into church and so in cooperstown there's this really stunningly beautiful um very early presbyterian church and we went every sunday and my dad was a deacon and i um my my relationship to religion was uh through the body in a very real way so i um it was it was all about the, um, you know, the tights, the woolen tights sort of slowly creeping down your legs to your, <laughs> your knees. And then you are released. And I think it was all about the release to the cookies um, where you like would rip off those woolen tights and run as fast as you could, just shove as many cookies as possible into your mouth. And and then at home, because I, you know, I, I'm a very nerdy kid, I've always been incredibly nerdy and I had a Bible and it was I don't know who gave it to me or probably I just probably stole it because I stole all of my books at that time um but it, it was just like as an animal relating to an object of beauty I I just still feel awe when I think about it right it had those super soft sort of translucent onion skin pages that you could see the words through and then the guilt all the way around and it's just and it smelled so good and then you read it and you read about people slaughtering people and people having sex and it was like amazing it was this amazing um repository of a story and sensual pleasure and so 
for a long time, um, my religion was very animal and very, but very, very real. Yeah. We have a lot of questions about your methods. So I'm going to try and okay. roll, roll this in a little bit into one. Um, with, how long did it take you to write the matrix? And do you have assistance with your research? And how long does it take? Yeah, so uh, matrix probably took, oh my goodness. Uh, I don't even know. Maybe, maybe not even a year, which is incredibly fast for me. I tend to write very, very fast, uh, very slowly. Um, but this book, I, I, because I was at Harvard when I started it, and I did have have research assistants there. Uh, I was able to get a lot done, um, a lot more done, and and I had access to a library, which I'm just. Um, uh, I am just a writer, right? I don't, I don't teach in any program other than a low residency program. So I don't have access to the University of Florida library, unfortunately. So what I do have to do research, it's a big pain in the butt. I have to buy all the books. They cost $60 and they're from 1923. It's really uh, painful. But there, I was able to just really access everything, take all the photocopies and come home and just, uh, plus I didn't have my family there. So I could do research like 18 hours a day and then collapse into bed with all my papers around me and like crumbs in the sheets. It was great. Um, but uh, so the, yes, so I did have research assistants, thank goodness. Um, the writing of it took me about a year. I finished it shortly before the pandemic started. <laughs> and then I edited it all the way through um, the first part of the pandemic. Yeah, it was it was no fun to be alone. How do you decide what to edit out is a question that just came in. Have you decided? Oh, what to edit out? yes. So here's the big trick of writing uh, historical fiction. I think that because you find so many delicious things, you just want to put everything into the book, right? You just want to like lard the book with joy. I think um, having having a lighter touch was always in my uh, perception of what this book was. So my model was Penelope Fitzgerald's The Blue Flower. I love that book so much. It's so good. It's about Novalis and it's a love story, but it's it, it's very weird. Um, but she, she, I mean, it's very much a historical fiction, but at the same time, it feels very modern. It's, it's strange. It doesn't have a lot of like these and those. And so I really had to struggle with putting in just enough, um, and enough to be plausible, enough of the historical stuff to be, to, to sort of, to anchor people in time. Um, I had to do enough research about sort of the way that the, the wheels of time t uh, moved, not only the daily wheels of time within an abbey, which was very specific and very particular, but also the larger seasonal ones, the religious ones, everything is at that time was wheels within wheels. And so I had to understand all those wheels. Um, so truly, I mean, when I, when I write, I overwrite, I write probably, uh, for each draft, probably 300 pages, which I then throw out and start over again. And I started over again with a slightly more refined vision of what it is that I'm trying to write toward. But really the process of throwing out, starting over again is a, is a process of basically enforced, um, catharsis because it gets rid of all the things that I thought were necessary to the work, but were not the living details, not the things that absolutely needed to be in the work. And and so they, they sort of leave halfway through if this is the way that you do it. You write a draft, throw it out, start over again. Uh, I keep muting because my family and my dog are making noise in the house, but you have more <laughs> questions about this, this very topic as well. Um, along the lines of, uh, do you find a struggle in balancing motherhood and writing and family life in general in writing? So um, this is a question that I once very loudly <laughs> said I would never answer unless I'd heard a male writer being asked it. But luckily, I've heard a male writer being asked it, so I can actually answer this question. Here we go. Um, I don't struggle with this, and it's not, I, you know, um, it's it's because before the boys were born, I created a citadel around my work, and um, 
and it is the thing that I do and it's the strongest thing um and everyone has to sort of bend around my citadel which sounds very very arrogant but I don't care um I think part of it is and this is real and if there are people who are struggling with this it's a suggestion that worked for me um I sat down with my husband and we wrote out basically a contract and it's an actual physical piece of paper on which all of our expectations and our and of childcare and work are put out just baldly on the on the page because what happens in our society in general when a when there's a man and a woman in a relationship and the woman is the one who has the babies there's this assumption that um she's the primary caregiver and um it's i mean there's studies galore about how housekeeping is not split 50 50 and uh i don't want to be a resentful person i don't want to be an angry resentful mother i don't want to hate my husband for not doing half the work so we really did divide it up. And one of the things we, we realized was I work really well in the morning as soon as I get up. So I'll get up at five in the morning. I'll go straight to my work. I don't have to do anything from the day before the boys were born. I haven't had to do anything. So I don't feed them. I don't clean them. I don't flush the toilets. I don't make breakfast. I don't make lunch. I don't take them to school. I don't make sure that they're ready for school at all. I don't see anyone. And if anyone bothers me, like I become like a banshee, like I chase them out of the room. Um, and we did that in order to protect that time and that space as my workspace. This is also to say that um, I'm very lucky to have that that guy in the other room, right? Like that is a lucky thing, but also we codified it. And if one of us is unhappy, we go back to the piece of paper and we talk about, talk it through and we try to make it balanced. Um, because I do think that this is a very real peril when it comes to raising children and trying to do your work is that you want to be with the kids. They're cool. They're the greatest humans on the planet. All you wanna do is be in the same room as them. Um, but I would not personally get any work done if I were to do it in the same room as them. So it's a very long winded answer to say, um, yeah, I don't struggle with it, but uh, it's because I, I made a contract. Not romantic. I said this in Poland once and they're very romantic people and they were so angry with me. Like that was like the headline, like Lauren Groff is the least romantic person on the planet. She makes a contract. It's like, yeah, but I'm not mad at my husband. So, <laughs> um, let's take it back to the book for a minute here. Uh, one question is, did you choose the voice talent who narrates the matrix on audible? I did. Okay. Who has why? I, this is, I love this so much. Um, Bridgerton. So the, the Duchess. Bridgerton, she's yeah. a Joe and Doa. She's actually the, the reader of the book. And so I knew from the beginning that I needed um, a very wry, sort of mature British voice. Uh, and the, she's so good. I mean, she's so good. I, this is her. I mean, I, she does a lot of acting, acting, but she also does a great number of uh, book readings. And I heard her and I cannot stop listening to her. She's amazing. And she sort of, she, she, I think she takes some of the, the funny scenes and she really spins them and makes them even funnier. I love her. I'm so happy that she did it. She's so, she's such a good actress. And now, like, I, I don't, I don't want people to see her as Marie, of course, but I'm not against that. I think she's very, very cool. I love yeah. her too. Uh, Marie is so well described physically as tall and plain looking. Is there a drawing or a painting of her on view somewhere? No, she, so there's nothing that we know about her life actually, period. Um, we do, the, some historians believe that she may have been a, an abbess from France in England, right? So that's why I took that um, as, as sort of a, a standpoint. Um, some other people think she may have been uh, Eleanor Vacutin's first daughter from her marriage to Louis Nisset, um in France, uh, Marie. I don't know. Nobody knows anything about the actual Marie de France. 
So nobody knows what she looks like. Nobody knows anything, anything whatsoever, or where she comes from, anything. Uh, so what I did when I was trying to build this character is that I went back to her lay and her fables, and I just sat down with the books and plucked out of each book uh, the imagery and the ideas that I found deeply compelling and sort of built this almost piece of flash fiction out of them. And then I looked at this piece of flash fiction and I tried to extrapolate from that personality and out of personality, physical form and shape. So it was really the opposite, I think, of what historians would do. Um, I, but I went back to her work and I tried to, to make her work speak her, her person into being. We have a lot more here. I'm sorry. OK, no, it's all good. I'm very happy to answer. Can you talk more about the methods, aids, and strategies that you use so masterfully to interweave historical context and compelling character development? Oh, that's so nice. Uh, it's it, I, well, I, I'm looking back at it from a stance of uh, years now, and it feels like uh, controlled chaos, <laughs> I, which it's contradictory. But uh, I had notebooks full of ideas and notes in places where I got uh, things. But in general, I put those notebooks aside when I sit down to write because I think that if the detail is strong enough it will live within the draft that comes through and then of course I had to to go back and check details check where Eleanor was at any given time what was happening in the world uh, when the children's crusade was for instance um, and and really figure things out and I made a huge number of mistakes I have historian friends who read the book for me thank goodness and then I have at Riverhead, who's my publisher, we have absolutely stunningly brilliant copy editors and fact checkers, which thank God for them, because, you know, no matter what, there will be mistakes in any book. There's a mistake. You will find a book. There's no such thing as a pristine, unmistaked book. Um, but and, and I actually know of four that I've made in this one. But it's really a process of um, trying to figure out how the detail speaks to the larger ideas that you're playing with or the character, the way the characters are developing and keeping them if they, if they, um, they do those things for you. We have a couple of fans of your modern day books, uh, Fates and Furies in Florida. And uh, the question is, do you find it more difficult to write in the modern day or in a historical context? Oh, no. Uh, so I don't find it necessarily difficult either way. It's not, it's not, a, for me, I wouldn't sit down with a project and think, oh, no, I'm, I'm, I'm really scared to do this. I think at the time that I was trying to write Vasta Wilds and then Matrix, I just I didn't feel as though I had a good um, standpoint for my vision of the world uh, as a contemporary person, just because you, you remember um, 2019, 2018, it just felt as though it was just a constant never ceasing series of waves of disaster one after the other and you, you couldn't actually even get a breath you were just being dragged down with every single wave and um i just couldn't i couldn't function long enough to to see the world clearly and i need to be able to see see clearly and it's it, it sounds mystical like i'm having actually like marie like visions and i'm not but I do need to be able to see the story or to see the thing that I I need to examine very deeply. Um, so I don't I don't know if I would um, describe. Oh God, this is going to sound arrogant. I don't mean this. Um, I don't. Dis, I wouldn't describe writing as difficult, not because it's not, but because I get so excited about my project 
that uh, even if it is difficult, my like sheer enthusiasm and joy and pleasure seeking uh, makes me feel as if it's not difficult, if that makes any sense. So I, I don't think that the modern day ones are, are more difficult. I don't think the historical ones are more difficult. I just wanted, I just want to chase the story that's giving, filling me with joy and light. Couple of more uh, character questions. Okay. Do you find Marie as enigmatic as Matilde in Fate and Furies? Which I might. I do I'm not. Thinking. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. No, I don't. And I don't because Marie is very blunt, right? She's very, she's very much who she is. I think she's probably um, bold. She's uh, probably pretty arrogant. She. Um, doesn't have wonderful social graces. Uh, she's she's very enthusiastic. <laughs> she but she's also insanely smart. She's just um, just a brilliant person. And I don't think that if she were to put be put at any point in her life into the middle of a court, in session, she'd be able to function as well. She's not a social animal, but she is a political animal. So she's able to, from a distance, from um, a, a place of great vision, able to look out and, and change the world uh, with her um, very distant um, powers. I don't find her enigmatic at all. I do find Matilda pretty enigmatic uh, and she, but because I think she she hides things from not only all the people around her but also from her own self she's she's just a person who's who's in hiding and and that's why she's enigmatic uh, another along those lines because you wrote a beautiful story about Eloise and Abelard. Again, I'm going to apologize if I'm mispronouncing names. Um, did Eloise's experience in the convent contribute to your recreation of Marie? Yes, the story of Abelard and Eloise is one of my absolute favorite stories of all times. And it was a story that I studied in my French classes in, in university. Um, yeah, yeah, this really helped a lot. Of course, uh, the, the letters between Abelard and Eloise are said now to have been forged, which makes me really sad to think about. Uh, but they were real people. Uh, Abelard was a real philosopher in Paris. Um, Eloise was a real person that fell in love with him and they, they fell in love with each other. And um, horrible things happened to both of them. They had a child out of wedlock. Uh, she became an abbess. He got castrated. It was all very awful, um, but it's a it's an incredible it's an incredible story. Um, I actually wrote before I wrote that short story, which is my first published piece of fiction, I believe. Uh, it came out in two thousand and six. Um, and uh but it came out of a novel that i had written and then failed to actually make into a good novel uh th that i wrote when i was about 23 and it was um the story of abelard and eloise set in a scientology tower and i thought it was hilarious and nobody else liked it at all nobody else <laughs> read it and so i threw it aside and um i went and got my mfa a couple of years later i was about to go into Lori Moore's class, and I love Lori Moore. I think she's brilliant. She was she was one of the first contemporary writers that I ever read because you don't read contemporary writers in general until you go, get into creative writing classes. At least I didn't. Um, and I was writing at the time these Airsats Lori Moore stories, which is so embarrassing to think about giving her like a lesser version of her own stories. So I had to like scramble and think about how to to write something so different from her work. And then um, Abelard and Eloise came back to me and uh, this amazing real life uh, swimmer named Athelda Blybtree, who's the, the first American female uh, gold medalist, but she had had polio and she'd survived the 1918 flu epidemic, all of this stuff. Uh, and so all of these things came together. And again, it was a nuclear reaction. And uh, that story was was born. Thank goodness. That's that's the story that gave me my agents. Yeah. Um, 
somewhat related, but how much of yourself goes into characters you write about and do dreams help you create? Yeah, so uh, there is no character I've ever written who doesn't have a little piece of me in it. And I'll actually, there are a lot of characters in this book in particular that have family members <laughs> in them, which I would hope very much that they don't see themselves there. Um, but I think um, it's, a, it's a lot. I mean, it's a lot. A, I, I, there's no book that's ever written out of a vacuum and we need to, to feed off of other people, unfortunately. Um, what was the second question? I'm sorry, I've lost it already. Did dreams help you create? Dreams, yes, well, sort of. I, I don't ever remember my dreams, but I do get up at five in the morning and with a cup of coffee go straight to work and I'm not fully awake by then and I do it because I'm kind of type a and I really like to control everything but if you can't control anything if you're because you're still dreaming a lot of really beautiful stuff comes out before your internal editor pipes in and says stop you're you're sounding wild um bonkers yeah so uh dreams in some ways do help because I like to be in somewhat of a dream state when I begin my work on a daily basis. Yeah. All right, I'm gonna ask one more reader question and then kick it back to Colette because we're okay. at eight o'clock. All right. Um, what do you, we did a little bit of this in the preamble that some, some of the audience got to hear, but what do you read when you aren't doing research for your books? I read everything and Colette, Colette and I, we, we were talking about books. Um, I do, I read about 300 books a year. Not to, uh, I mean, like I, I like to track it because I'm a very perfectionist like person who likes to do that. But I also like to read uh, as many as possible so that I can reach for things that I don't think that I would reach for otherwise. So um, I read a lot of plays. I read a lot of books of poetry. They're very fast to read. <laughs> I read a lot of audiobooks. Um, I go for many runs and as I'm running, I like to, to listen and to, to hear things at two times speed because it makes me feel faster. Um, and yeah, so uh, what did I read recently? Okay, I read a galley of a book called All This Could Be Different by Sarah Tonka Matthews and it's out next year and it's amazing. I read Trust by Hernan Diaz, it's amazing. I read a book, um, it's a reissue of a 1977 sort of psychological horror that I absolutely loved. It's called They and it's by K. Dick uh, and that's amazing. So I read basically everything I can get my hands on uh, and, and just, um, and I have a reading group with my writer friends and we're, we're in the middle of reading all of Proust again together and that's really fun because we just do 100 pages a week and then talk about it it's really lovely okay we're good <laughs> all right um thank you thank you Ellen and Lauren thank you so much this has been just wonderful um, oh my pleasure thank you it would be better if we were in the same room together I know um, and, uh, and the audience were there with us, but we'll do that, we'll do that. Um, I wanna remind everyone that uh, the festival continues this week, each day through Sunday. Tomorrow night, I'll be talking to Michael Connolly, Wednesday night to Honoré Fanon Jeffers. Thursday is Books and Bourbon with Lisa Unger and Ace Atkins. On Friday, I'll be talking to Cynthia Barnett and Craig Pittman. On Saturday to Michael Corita, and on Sunday to the amazing Louise Erdrich. Um, but I could not have asked for a better kickoff uh, guest than Lauren Groff. Many, many thanks to her. And I will be waiting eagerly for that next book. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you so much, Colette. It's so lovely to speak with you. I really Thank appreciate you, it. Lauren. Thanks Thank so you, much. everyone. Good night. Good night. <laughs>